What's there, everybody? It's Jason here, Film Fanatic Productions. Thank you all so much for coming to the channel today. So today, we are going, continuing our ongoing Disney series by reviewing the third Disney classic film that was released in 1940, and that is, of course, Fantasia. Now, when this film was released, it was marketed as a whole new cinematic experience and as a musical anthology film, and it was part of a long-time desire by Walt Disney, which is, of course, the founder of Walt Disney Studios and Disney World and Disneyland, that, and that is to use the medium of film to reinvent classical music. So, without getting too much into it, let's dive right in. So, Fantasia opens with a new inclusion in these original Disney animated series, and that is real people. Yes. It starts off with scenes of members of the orchestra gathering against a blue background and tuning their instruments, followed by a master of ceremonies, and that is Deems Taylor in this case, entering the stage, and... As Taylor alludes, the purpose of this film is not to tell one complete story, as we've seen in the films before this one and films after it, but instead to show a number of musical, well-known musical compositions that each are tell one, they each tell their own story, and they're visually um, adapted and imagined by animators at Walt Disney. So the first composition that we see is is the Toccata and Fuge in D minor by Johann um, Sebastian Bach, and this uses Shots of the orchestra illuminated in blue and gold, backed by superimposed shadows, which in turn fade into abstract patterns. And then the animated lines, shapes, and cloud formations reflect the sound and rhythms of the music that we're hearing. And this set felt like, to me, kind of a warm-up for the audience, because it's, it's the first time they're able to um, visually see what their imaginations might be thinking about when they first hear a piece of music. And I also love how the way how the colors and the shadows are used around the orchestra of renowned comp and composer, around the renowned composer um, Leopold Stokowski. And I've seen a number of recent music videos by artists like Lana Del Rey, as well as in some movies that use this type of style and lighting to set mood for songs visually. So this is actually a quite an iconic scene for this film. After this first scene, there are seven more compositions. However, I'm not going to go every, through every single one and read off line by line the wiki page. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to give you my honest review as a filmmaker and as, of course, a Disney lover, what my reaction was to this film and what it means to me. So the first thing I love about this film was, of course, the animation. Yes, the animation. By this point, Walt Disney Animation Studios was reaching a level of artistry that put them at the forefront of this medium, and Fantasia really exemplifies this. From the graceful fairies and Nutcracker set to the striking backgrounds of Mythical Greece in the Pastoral Symphony set, there is a level of perfection in this anime craft that is rarely matched. And there's also an intentional use of contrasting colors that I felt helped give that film that extra little bit of pizzazz and beauty. And another thing that sets Fantasia apart from the other Walt Disney classic films is the emphasis as well as the lack of use of sound in this film. So what I mean by that? What I mean is that this film was created to show how music and film could be synced to create a whole encompassing experience for audiences. And in fact, this film was the very first one to use stereo surround sound and with the advent of Fanta sound by RCA around this time period. And this gave audiences the ability to hear orchestra and other sounds as if they were actually in the concert listening to the orchestra, which is I thought was a pretty neat fact that I learned. But however, I noticed that aside from Taylor's monologues and the occasional quip from Mickey Mouse and and Sikowski, there really isn't any dialogue in any of the of these short sets um, films. But 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 it's almost every of these sets, it's up to the audience to decipher what the meaning is behind these visuals that they're seeing. So it kind of, kind of gives the audience a level of um, engagement with these with this film. And the exception to this is the use of a chorus to sing the closing song Ave Maria. And as someone who aspires to help design, record and design um, sound in movies and television one day, I really enjoyed um, the, how they showed the evolution of the sound waves in this movie. And I especially enjoyed the meet the sound wave part as well during the intermission part of this film. And the last point I wanted to make is the sheer, is the, that this film is about how unique it is. And that this film is sets this has a place in cinematic history to be remembered. And this film was in production for actually nearly five years. And with The Sorcerer's Apprentice being the original starting point for what this film was going to be. But then it was supposed to be a, um, a, 
uh, it must be a pivot for Disney to reinvent Mickey Mouse after the success of um, Steamboat Willie in 1928. But after that success of that first short that he did, started to decline in interest. He wanted to reinvent it. So that's what this film was originally about. But afterwards, um, in the ninth, late 1930s, it was decided to make a feature-length film to gain a more profitable release for the film. And over the course of production, the studio actually would conceive consulting from musicians, technicians, historians, biologists, ballet dancers, paleontologists, zoos, and even, yes, astronomers. And this was truly a level of research and careful deliberations to craft an artistically masterful film that, excuse me, that redefined how movies, movies are heard, seen, and developed for years to come. But unfortunately, the high cost to make this movie paired with the, the expensive um, need to overhaul theaters to present the film, and lastly, wartime restrictions that kind of hindered this film being released worldwide, um, unfortunately made this film not be able to recover its budget um, to several re-releases years and years on. But I feel deeply that some of the aspects of movies and TV that we take for granted today, like surround sound, musicals, soundtracks, music videos, and even the popularity of Mickey Mouse himself, would not be possible without this film. So there you have it, my review of Fantasia, the third movie on our ongoing Disney series to watch every single Disney classic film. I hope you guys enjoyed that reaction today. I know I certainly did, and um, I enjoyed doing this review, and I re recommend that all of you guys go see Fantasia on Disney Plus or wherever you have it. Um, since it's truly a beautiful and impactful film, and it's anyone can watch it and just have their imagination racing. So it's just a perfect one of the perfect movies to watch for, for everyone in the family. So, hope you guys have a great day. I thank you all so much for watching this video today. And if you made it to the end of the video, thank you. It really does help me grow this channel. And I'm also like to let you guys know that next week we actually will not be posting a video since I'll be in South Carolina for a golf tournament. But besides that, hope you guys have a great day and a great weekend. And always remember, become film fanatic.